save it as a new name? Yeah. At least it's not going to finish anymore. <laughs> it's trying to refinish. Okay, I'm going to call it you know, updated. my flash memory stick and send it to you so you have a copy of the final version. How's that sound? Sure. You are really expert at all this. This is like all the presentation. Um, I do it a lot. I do it a lot. So, yeah. just says updated. The one you want to post here, it'll just say monthly updated. So you want to get it, get it up? The, oh, hold it's, on. it's on. We have it up. But I mean, oh, you want to put it up on the web, you're saying? Um, Can you put that up no, there? No, I was going to suggest, let's pair up this. Please touch the screen. Oh, we have to so, do yes. And it's the PC. Yes, you're right. And it's going to power up, and then you can just um, open it up and in the usual way. Yeah, it's um, up. We have it at the top. It's, it's ready. Yeah. So we, we just have, have to get the machine up. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> well, that's doing that. I'm going to begin to gather people up. To yeah. People As you know, <laughs> the best time is right for lunch, but sometimes not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wake them up. Though. No, no. Yeah, I'll hand it to Yeah, I don't know how much you move around, but you could either keep it on here or yeah, go for it. Yeah. So now you're being recorded. Is it? Is this live? On? It is on. It's not All right. Past, it's just being recorded. Okay. We're at 10 to. <clears throat> So we've got our timer set for 20, okay, right, like that. So if we get started, we're all set. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> Remember, after we're done, the other rooms, and we'll come back here for the final one. The other room has the three breakouts. This room has one, a workshop, which... Yeah. <clears throat> 
I think it would be best to have you. Well, you'll be able to see better from over there, actually. Or you could sit in the front row, too. Is there anyone sitting there? Yeah. Okay. So why don't you just take that one, I think, yeah. That's probably best. And I'll hand you the microphone. I have the microphone. I'll hand you the microphone. Okay. Oh, they're recording it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm better. It's better for me to sit sitting there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that way you can cue me better. Okay. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, everyone, for that long time. Um, we're very pleased to be able to introduce you to Curtis Bond and Mimi Lee, who are going to do their talk. Um, they're talking about stepping into life change and new measure of the impact of news and open education. You got your water there. You want a cup? <laughs> Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, wow, I didn't even say it twice. Usually I have to say it twice. As you notice, my voice is going on me a little bit here. I flew in from Finland this morning. I was presenting there at this time yesterday in Tampere and, flew, and woke up at 3 a.m. to take a bus to come join you. So actually, I actually didn't wake up. I didn't go to bed. So um, my colleague Mimi Lee and I are going to talk about MOOCs and open education and some of the research we've been doing. Uh, I've got my timer set at 20 minutes, so uh, at the end of 20 minutes, we're going to give away seven, um, seven books of my new book called Adding Some Tech Variety, which all of you can get for free if you go to techvariety.com. You can download the new book for free. There's no H in tech. I've made it a free book and so forth. Well, Mimi and I are working on a book on MOOCs and open education, and Amy is in the audience somewhere here. She's writing a chapter for us uh, with Rutledge. So um, we don't have the chapters in yet, or we talk about that. We're going we're to talk about life change here in this particular talk. Uh, and hopefully we'll have some inspiring questions from all of you and you'll get a free book if you one of these paper ones and um, so we should probably get started since it's about the 19 minutes here so stepping into life change not stepping into quicksand or doggy do or something life change a new measure of the impact of MOOCs and open education and you see some of the people here from India and Netherlands and Spain taking a MOOC from UPenn and Professor Peter Strzok teaching 50,000 students around the world in mythology and, you know, that actually where your son, I think, goes to school at, at UPenn. It's, you know, it's one of the leaders in the field, you, uh, in the U.S., anyhow. Um, audience poll. How many of you remember what you were doing when 9-11 happened? How many of you remember 4-11? One of you. Fred does. What's happening in 4-11? Two days before my wedding Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <coughs> On April 4th, 2001, Charles Vest announced that education should be free. I sent him my resume that night, I, I spoofed it up, sent it off to him, spiced it up, I should say. He never returned my call, never returned the email, I don't know why. <laughs> but I was interested in this phenomenon back in 2001. We were lucky, and, and Mimi and I, in collecting data from MIT. So we're going to give you some data and show what uh, people are doing with MIT OpenCourseWare since that time, as well as taking a MOOC, my, uh, I did the first MOOC with Blackboard uh, on um, teaching online, and we analyzed some of that data as well. But Charles Vest said, hey, this is bigger than MIT. You all should be jumping in on this. This is a unique phenomenon, and this is, these are unique times. And so um, he's trying to look at how can we raise the quality of learning and education. My right, second question here, it said polling question one earlier. This is another polling question one, should say two. Has learning technology ever transformed your life? Raise your hand. How about in the past year? Okay, changed my life. I was a board CPA and corporate controller, but I escaped the cube farms. This was my first computer, by the way. I was a laptop computer, mobile, weighed 40 pounds, US pounds. Flash, uh, zip, uh, you know, the floppy disk held 48K of memory, that's it. You know, 2,500 bucks. My boss said, what would someone need a personal computer for? But that's another story. We were two blue IBM mainframe all the way. Uh, and we went under after I went off to grad school. But I escaped the cube farms through TV and correspondence. I know TV and correspondence wasn't as good as face-to-face -face for me, but, I, but it changed my life. And I think some of us are looking at, is MOOCs better than 
face to face or not, or people are dropping out, but lives are changing despite whatever we're calling dropouts within all that. So let's fast forward 25 years, and today, as Fred, he's, someone said, hey, a copy of my World is Open book. In that book, I point out anyone can learn anything from anyone else at any time. And the kids today have technology wrapped all around them, as you can see there. Um, different technologies. We do too. <coughs> Everybody on the plane with me today was checking things as, <coughs> immediately as we got off. The old technology, prehistoric Googling. Some of you remember that, right? Raise your hands. You're certifiably old. Okay. <coughs> New technologies that enable us to access, filter, share information. You know, the world's become more visual, more collaborative, more open, more online, more blended, more ubiquitous, more comfortable. Learning is changing in many ways. And we're going to talk about open. Whether we're talking about 80-year-old gentlemen getting their degree finally, or women in the rainforest in wheelchairs learning online from the University of the People. This guy's learning from Western Governors University. This Yak Herger from Tibet learning from Open Yale. Life's changing for many people out there. We, the press tends to ignore that. The press doesn't talk about life change at all. They're only looking at one simple number that doesn't really mean a whole lot. Um, now, what, what's happening? I'm going to give you some current news. My friend Chuck Severance is doing a MOOC right now on programming for everyone, trying to get high school teachers to learn how to program. This guy is the guy with the open source tattoo who built Sakai, if you've heard of Sakai Foundation. He uh, traveled to Barcelona, met his students, traveled to Seoul, Korea, met his students, traveled to Manila, Melbourne. He travels the world meeting his students. University of London has a course on research methods right now. June 18th, announcement from Oregon State, we're going to offer a PD MOOC for teachers. I think MOOCs particular professional development MOOCs, theory-driven MOOCs, remedial MOOCs make a lot of sense. You know, teachers don't have to come on campus then for this, or dentists, or doctors, or whatever. In fact, June 17th, there was an announcement that, um, uh, I got an email anyhow, announcing a website uh, called um, OEDB.org. It's an open education database. And they were trying to index MOOCs, and I, I wrote to them, it's, it's, a, it's a voluntary base. This is not a corporate or a company doing this. They've been working on this for a number of years, creating and uh, exploring open courses, free, you know, whether it's free art classes, humanities classes, biology classes, or whatever. Of course, the Sailor Foundation is doing this, too, out of DC. Uh, this woman here is taking a short MOOC. There's a couple of Russian entrepreneurs creating a, a new company that's um, that's trying to challenge traditional um, instruction by creating short, pithy kinds of MOOCs. Uh, and um, you know, whether that's going to take off or not, I'm not, not quite sure. That was May, May 5th, 2014. And I'm missing the name of the company, unfortunately. And maybe somebody can help me out and look that up. Uh, October 31st, 2013, Sir John Daniels says, let's make an open education resource university where you can sign up for any class you want. But if you have course credit, if you want uh, certificates, then you pay. So it's a pay for the, you know, there's a, there's a lot of business models here. As a former accountant, I've come up with 15 business models for MOOCs. I'm not going to go through all 15, but one of them is to pay for certificates, pay for the assessments. And I'm <clears throat> at about two minutes left before I switch over to Mimi here. Uh, in Rwanda, they have a set of MOOCs up online, or they're taking, repurposing MOOCs for, uh, they're repurposing MOOCs to get kids hybrid programs. So in Rwanda, they're taking open education courses, contents, and creating courses out of them. But there are problems, many problems, despite all the hype, despite all the, the positive successes, despite all the life change. We, we hear about the University of Edinburgh, we hear about Duke University, we hear about MIT and Harvard, and the dropout rates, but not everyone's there to finish the course, they're there to learn a little bit, to learn to find out what online learning's like. We hear about lack of engagement. Well, not everybody's there actually to take that course, they just you know, thought they might browse it like being in a library. You know, I think MOOCs are more like being in a, exposed to a library than being in a course. If we, we never look at how many people finish reading the book or that they opened up. We don't give that, the, the media never reports that kind of thing. But we do open up minds when they open up books. We open up minds, we open up doors. We give people possibilities for life change. There's some data showing that, yes, the majority of men, young people uh, with a bachelor's degree are the majority taking MOOCs. You know, people already coming in with degrees. This little infographic statistic came out uh, about a month and a half ago. So that's a problem. Another problem is the issue of impact. You know, where are we impacting? Are we impacting just people in North America and the UK? Are we offering, you know, are we impacting people, in particular, if you look at this slide, uh, the uh, <clears throat> The percent of people having degrees already taking courses in North Africa is pretty large. We're not getting you know, people in, in, in parts of the world that we would like to get exposure to uh, taking these MOOCs, so the impact issues. We're not impacting the underprivileged. Two-thirds of people taking Coursera courses 
are coming from the developed world, not the, underdeve not the undeveloped world or underdeveloped world. Number five, assessment and credentialing issues regarding MOOCs. Are, they real, are we going to have, are we actually going to have some kind of um, uh, certificate or course credit or a program uh, degree or something else or badges or something like that? So issues of assessment and, and credentialing are also pervasive. Lack of feedback. Now Coursera is forming learning hubs to meet with other people, chat with other people, whether you're living in Kenya or uh, Argentina or, or Venezuela or other parts of the world, you have a learning hub to come meet other folks in New York City or, or in London here. And localization of content. Of course, I just announced that they're going to have a set of people localize contents now. We studied, Mimi and I a long time ago studied the OOPS project out of Taiwan where they were translating MIT contents free to the world in Chinese. Of course, Sarah just picked up on this notion. They're a for-profit taking advantage of people volunteering their time to make Coursera a more profitable company. Think about that. Um, so that's a, that's a big issue. This guy from Korea says we need more C, OC MOOCs, one culture, one culture MOOCs. So we have all Koreans around the world, all expats around the world, taking content that's not in English or dominated in English, but in Korean. He also said we need human MOOCs, H MOOCs, but I'm not sure what he means by that. And we need to stop having the government shut down the MOOCs for people in Syria. One day you talk about a guy in Syria whose life changed through MOOCs, and the next day the U.S. government shuts down the spigot and don't, uh, doesn't allow courses going to Cuba, Iran, Syria, and so forth. So there's some serious issues around all these MOOCs. This guy did get access to it eventually. There was a lot of uh, hoopla about that. But on the other hand, there's life change. There's people at Wells Wellesley College, this guy in particular, who has a MOOC. He says, in my MOOC on Alexander the Great, students are inspired. Um, their, their lives are being changed. There's inspiration, passion, love of learning. We hear about Starbucks offering online courses. There's a lot of people serving you coffee at Starbucks whose lives are going to be changed, as the announcement last week, for free online education. And um, finally, this woman here in Afghanistan was announced last week that she's going to fly to the U.S. to he headline a conference for corporate trainers, and she's been learning online through digital education. And Elliot Maisie and the Maisie Institute decided to have her be the keynote of the conference, talking about how her life was changed and inspired. Uh, the Gates Foundation is doing research around MOOCs, inter uh, having uh, the researchers do short little videos of what their research says. I think we need student, learner, participant, videos about how their lives are changing. Anyways, we studied MIT OpenCourseWare, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, MIT OpenCourseWare is used around the world. Uh, we had mostly males over age 40, 50 percent. We had 1,400 completed surveys. And they came from India, China, Brazil, Nigeria, Pakistan. They were mostly curious about the topic, interested in the topic, self-improvement, wanting to learn something, and so forth. Uh, more personal control. They're not looking to get a certificate, not looking to get a badge. They were learning science and math and foreign language and culture. They were looking for new skills, bettering their lives, helping society out. Credit bearing was way down the list. So again, the media is hyping this side, but people are looking to change society. They want to learn something new, want freedom, and so forth. Personal freedom. Carl Rogers, freedom to learn in psychology. Uh, fun, fantasy, choice, adventure. This is all in the new book. I have a, this is a book on, op, on motivation and retention online with 10 principles of motivation. This comes out in open courseware. This comes out in MOOCs, why people are involved in them. So Mimi's going to talk a bit about the qualitative side of things here and then switch it back to me at the very end. Mm -hmm. oh, I need to give you the microphone. Okay, so I was invited to um, conduct an analysis on the qualitative data of the MIT OpenCourseWare study that Kurt just has mentioned. Um, out of 43 item survey, um, there were 25 open-ended items, and we received 613 completed responses. So my task was to analyze those 613 responses and see what they are actually saying. So kind of um, a different focus than what Kurt has just mentioned. I'm more interested in um, how do we interpret the life change or what do I, what, how do we make sense of what's happening um, with MOOCs learners. And um, stepping back a little bit, I'm by, by training, I'm a 
quality researcher and more of a critical ethnographer. So I'm, I'm very interested in more micro level um, issues. So you can imagine um, the challenge that I face looking at this survey items, which I don't usually do. I'm doing more, you know, I'm more of an interview and observation person. Um, but the whole idea of MOOCs and um, finding a way to um, understand the, the MOOCs learners in a way that is meaningful for me as a quality researcher was interesting enough, so I just took on the challenge. Um, I'm looking at culture and the identity of MOOC learners, and we are using mixed methods with a group of researchers. I'm using the word mixed methods in a loose term. In a way, it's not quantitative and qualitative mix, but more of qualitative research methods and um, two, two methods um, combined in, in the um, analysis. And there are four of us who are um, working. And um, so what we found out um, through this overall qualitative analysis about MOOCs learners is that they have strong intrinsic motivation. Um, a lot of people said this is for my own pleasure. That was focused and mentioned um, repeatedly. And emphasis on autonomy. Nobody helped me. They said it very proudly. You know, nobody helped me. I did it on my own. Um, the fact that I didn't have anybody to help me seemed to be a source of pride for these um, learners. Love for creation and sharing. Um, membership of community and in the community with people of similar interests. So this is kind of a general idea of MOOC learners that um, we have noticed. Um, the challenge with this big data set was that, especially in this term, 43 items and um, 25 open-ended question items, there were possible overlaps between the open-ended questions, and I was not involved in making those um, questions. So when I was given the, the set of data, there were a lot of overlaps. And so there were connected responses across the questions. So out of 25 um, questions, if what we realize is some people don't answer um, when they say something about, okay, what was the challenge? What didn't you not, what did you not like about your experience MOOCs? And they say something like, oh, everything was okay. And so if I look at that, that person didn't have any problem with, you know, the MOOCs that they took. But along the line by, say, out of 25 questions, by question 23 or 24, when we asked, when the question asked, okay, do you have any advice or suggestions for future peop, uh, learners in MOOCs? They would have um, suggestions and advices that are very critical. And so there was a discrepancy between the, their, their answer in number one when they, when, when they were asked, do you have any things that you didn't like, which was no. And by you know, item 24, they had all these you know, ideas and advices for people who are planning to take uh, MOOCs. So we've noticed, and I've noticed that looking at um, these questions by item wouldn't give me a, a good um, or meaningful answer. So I've decided to um, analyze 25 items by participants. So instead of going, you know, vertical, we decided to go across and treat um, each participant and 25 answers by each participant as a short interview. So um, treating um, as 76 for short interviews. Um, actually, there are six. 605 MIT course um, answers, and there were Blackboard um, questions, Blackboard data sets. So out of six, um, 764, there are only 605 MIT open course were interviewed. So the challenge has been that I'm reading, um, just because I don't have anything else to do, all 605 um, interviews as short interviews. And it's taking a lot of time, and I have, I have read all 605 answers, but um, it's been painstakingly you know, tedious um, work in terms of the, the um, speed, but it has been very meaningful because I get to um, 
see what people have said about their experiences in a meaningful way. So, <coughs> this is a kind of a short description of we, um, there were, and another member of the four researcher group for us, one decided to use en vivo because she felt like, you know, it's, you know, we have to do this quickly. We can't, we can't read all 605 uh, questions. So she's doing en vivo analysis. I'm doing manual analysis. So um, we are going to present um, the comparison between the same set of data but using two different um, ways of um, analyzing, which will be very interesting. And we are planning to uh, present it at ARA um, next year. Um, so the reason that we are doing this is importance of understanding complexities behind individual in, in, in experiences and challenges with big data and need for multiple perspectives and methods in data analysis. So some of the findings that we have, um, at least I was able to come up with from my manual analysis is the need to understand heterogeneity of MOOCs participants and complexity behind their motives for participation. And I'll uh, talk to you a little bit more about that. So for example, when you read the, um, when you read their responses, it's clear that there are shared values. For example, some common shared values are sense of purpose, importance of control, pride as a self-motivated autonomous learner. But there are very diverse ways of pursuing these values that seem very shared. So that is what I mean by heterogeneity and complexity behind their, the data. So the di diverse ways of pursuing the values are manifested in contradicting ways. So even within the shared values, the way they are manifesting the values are very different and sometimes are contradicting. For example, about assessment and certifications, people have very different views about um, assessment and certification. So let me give you an example. So shared values, sense of purpose, importance of control, time and content, pride as self-motivated, learning as fun, share, sharing knowledge, sense of confidence, empowerment through peer recognition. So these are shared values. So complex manif manifestation of values, for example, assessment certificates and job improvement. So these are shared assessment certificates and job improvement. They are important. That's the shared value. But how they are talking about it, if you read it um, by participant, is there are people who want to do better in their current job. And there are people who want to use MOOCs for changing and getting a new job. And there are people who are um, doing MOOCs for job related in a way that they are seeking promotion within the job. So they will all show up as they are taking MOOCs to improve their job. But as you can see, um, depending where they are, yeah, um, their ideas and perspectives or um, thoughts about assessment certificates are very different. So for example, people who want to do better in their current job want the freedom to choose with no evaluation nor certificates. They just want to do, uh, they want to take MOOCs and be able to do a little bit better in their current job. The, the fact that there is no evaluation nor certificate, it's an attraction for them. If they want to change the job through their experience in MOOCs, <laughs> use skills on one's own time and pace with some form of assessment. So they want to take their um, working MOOCs, go to a, a new job and say, hey, there's a certificate that I've taken all these courses from Stanford, Harvard. So this will you know, put me more competitive in the uh, job. Seeking promotion within the job preference for assessment certificates that could be legitimately recognized the employer. So they don't care about um, just the assessment, just certificates, as long as they have something that can take to their you know, boss and say, I've taken this and you know, can you recognize my, my work in this? That would be uh, the important issue. More examples, valuing freedom to choose, but also wanting more evaluation structure to help make that choice. And also, they, a lot of people ask for formal support in the f informal learning environment. And learning just for the sake of learning, but they want their peer recognition about that. Okay, okay I have to stop at this point. I think I've, I've gone over a minute or two and some implications and moving forward, which we can talk about in our um, Q&A session. Thank you. And just so you know, if you get the slides, there are some examples of life change built within you know, people at different age groups and that are um, 
lives are being changed through the MOOCs, and uh, they're going back to grad school, they're getting new jobs. Thank you. They're getting new jobs, they're going back to grad school, and so forth and so on. Um, <clears throat> and getting new incomes, you know, starting a new business, retiring and starting a new business. So that's kind of the theme in here, you know, using the skills that they're learning online when they're ordering information at a restaurant and so forth. And by the way, Charles Vest has now passed away, just as a little slide on there. So um, we have five minutes left, I think, for Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, just if you want to get uh, the papers, we've written two papers up on this. I'm happy to send, just send me an email. They're in review uh, related to some of this data of, of life change, but quite a varied from, from teens all the way up to people in their 70s and 80s. We've got some uh, interesting quotes and phenomena. Thank you. So, um, thank you very yeah. much, Curtis mm -hmm. Thank yep. you. Have anyone any questions? Yep. Um, obviously, you've done your research. I wonder what you thought the important research questions we should be asking about MOOCs now. You want to try to start with that one? What questions should we be answering now or asking now? Um, for me, this, I mean, I, I'm biased as a critical um, researcher. Um, I guess I, I am excited about MOOCs, but at the same time, I'm not, let me just say, I probably would not offer a, a MOOC myself because I, you know, I really um, like the intimate setting of the, the courses I'm teaching. I really value one-to-one um, -one face or virtual interaction with my doctoral students. So the idea of MOOCs for me is very, very daunting and it just, it's, it's, it's not me. But I also embrace the whole idea of MOOCs as a next um, um, big not next, it's, it's a big thing now. So I'm very interested in critical questions um, about, about something like, you know, who is MOOCs really serving and who um, is marginalized and um, marginalized by this whole idea of MOOCs. For example, in San Diego State University in the States, um, the professors are really um, critical about this issue of MOOCs and their administrators trying to take the MOOCs as a way to, um, for the lack of better words, um, replace a lot of associate instructors. Um, so if they take MOOCs, uh, they em employ, I mean, in literally, if they implement MOOCs from Harvard or Stanford, for their students for especially um, freshman engineering uh, science classes. They can save a lot of money instead of hiring a lot of um, you know, associate instructors who are you know, teaching those courses. So those are the issues that are um, really kind of, uh, for me, important but a kind of dark side of MOOCs. So um, who are we serving and marginalizing through the imp implementation of MOOCs is something that I would be interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the attention paid to translation is is something important. Uh, and something we should be, you know, all, in fact, researching intercultural awareness issues, language translation, the tools that are out there for language, that, that would be something that actually we should be looking at, going back to the earlier question. I think also the tools from the Stanford Venture Lab enable more collaboration than some of the other ones, looking at cross-cultural collaboration across these, to answer again the first question, that would be another research area that we should investigate. Uh, and I forget the other half of your question was what? Uh, unhelpful that's happening. I, th I think w being reactionary to things like plagiarism and all of a sudden having an honor code. I think we're way too reactionary to things and not thinking ahead about the impact of some of these. So there's consistent new announcements, whether we're firing presidents at Virginia and then rethinking that. Just people are uh, knee-jerk reactions to all this and jumping and not having thoughtful plans, but that's, we know that's the case. Yeah. One more. Okay, one more. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so you mentioned that 
engagement is a major challenge for most of the MOOCs. Yeah. Because I need uh, MOOCs are relying on it in video or PowerPoint or slides, mm -hmm. PDFs. Uh, what what kind of uh, innovative engagement methods you have seen or or you visualize that could evolve for MOOCs? Say the last half again. What kind of? What kind of uh, other in, in engaging technologies do you visualize or engaging methods that could evolve for MOOCs or if you have seen some uh, other than the traditional? Yeah, I think the people at Harvard have done a nice job of responding to the PR that's been out there about engagement, and I think they're coming up with new, and in fact, they've released their data, much of their data, and scrubbed the data without names, so we all can all be analyzing it, but they, they're trying to look at, uh, mine this data for not just um, uh, completion, but actually what are the activities that they're engaged in, which are the activities they're selecting, and why, and the, and the, and the routes in which people are going through that data, that's more important, I think, I'm going to let Mimi try and we'll end here. You want you an engagement answer on that? Sure. Um, I think depending on what kind of course um, offering platforms they can use, they have different levels of engagement they are allowed to do. So first, um, something like Coursera, I think they have very um, tailored um, platform for um, their clientele, like Stanford and Harvard. So um, different kinds of uh, levels of engagements are possible based on what kind of platforms you are um, afforded. Yeah. And I just want to say thank you for allowing us to come in here as Americans uh, into this uh, event. And there's been three people who have been helpful to me since I've walked in the room. And I just want to give them the last three. Of all. I have, I'll have one more left, but here you go. And of course, Fred's winking at me there, and he would like one. Uh, <clears throat> so I have one more left to the per first person that comes up with a you know, question during break time or later on. So thank you very much.